So, I've noted that the word mind doesn't in any simple way refer to any specific thing. Um, and also that it's part of our everyday vocabulary. We, we use it all the time. One way we use it is in setting up various kinds of dualities, various oppositions. So we'll often see mind and brain talked about as if sometimes as if they were different things, sometimes as if they were different ways of talking about the same thing. And a similar distinction arises when we contrast something called mental with something called physical. Now we use this informally all the time, the difference between bodily health and mental health presupposes some kind of distinction like this. Um, the physical has come to stand for that which is definitely real and the mental then becomes very suspect, which is a bit of a problem sometimes. But these oppositions are ways of talking. Um, they are not words that divide the universe up clearly into two camps. Uh, one way to see that is that as we look at the way these topics are talked about in different languages, different words are used and there's no easy way to translate one word into another language. You don't have to go very far for this. So, for example, the word mind has no counterpart in German. Words that are used would be words that we would more likely apportion to spirit or to soul. Um, and as you go further from your cultural base, you'll find that such distinctions become less trustworthy. So this is an important notion. Obviously, in science, what we're trying to find out are um, ways of understanding the world that are not uh, that are as free from bias as is possible. We use the term objective as if that were a simple thing. It's not. We are trying somehow to characterize reality in a way that is independent of ourselves. And as we do so, the very language we use to do that is itself born of our culture. It's born of the historical processes that shaped you, your teachers, your ancestors, the society you live in, and so on. Um, I want to interrogate perhaps the most familiar of these, the mental, physical distinction a little more. As I said, when we speak of the physical, we need to ask, what do we mean by physical? It's not a satisfactory state of affairs if we say the mental is amorphous, indefinable, nowhere to be found, and the physical is that which is real and revealed by science, because then the science could have nothing to say about our being, <laughs> nothing to say it is of relevance to our experiential, wholeheartedly lived, passionate lives. So consider this famous scene from the Bible. This is Doubting Thomas, who has perhaps justifiable doubts about it, an outrageous story he's heard about Jesus Christ coming back from the dead. And he doubts and he's looking for a certain kind of proof, which is dramatically illustrated here by Caravaggio. What kind of proof is Doubting Thomas looking for? He wants to know, he wants, in a sense, something like physical proof. And here we can begin to unpack the senses of physical. You might think that means merely seeing with his own eyes. A very mental sort of thing to do. But in fact, if you look, he's got his finger in the wound probing. He's using his senses of touch to feel the wound. I don't want to get too gory about this, but the kind of proof that Doubting Thomas is looking for, well, we might say it's physical proof. It's proof that requires him to have a body and to experience the reality of the alleged risen Jesus. Um, so when we, when we say that he's looking for physical proof, the sense of physical we mean here has nothing to do with physics. It means something like experiential, something which you can experience for yourself without doubt, or something which you cannot doubt, or merely some vaguer sense of really real. Another way to see what the word physical means is to ask how do people use it. So here are some examples from Twitter. It is physically impossible for me to pay attention during class. That 
use of the word physics also doesn't seem to come from anything to do with Einstein and Newton. Um, would real be a good way to paraphrase that? Physically attractive high school students. To be physically attractive. Again, there's no physics that's going to underscore this. This has something to do with the body, I imagine. Have you ever missed someone you feel physically sick? Now, feelings, surely, would be as mental as you can get. And physic But physically sick, we use this. We say, I feel physically sick. We know what we mean when we do it. But what it does not do is carve the universe into the physical on one side and the mental on the other. I physically cannot sleep without pants on, with pants on. I am physically hurting. Oh, my God. 10 out of 10 agree it is physically impossible to say no to this face. I'm not going to overinterpret Twitter, but clearly this use of physical to mean real has something to do with reality available to an embodied being who encounters the world through the medium of their senses with all their feelings. That's very different from what physics shows us. And when we turn to physics, if we want to say, well, what did we mean by physical in the sense of the science of physics? We'd have to ask, which physics do you mean? Because physics is a changing body of knowledge um, and it comes into its clearest articulation perhaps with the 17th century work of Isaac Newton. Newtonian physics provided the paradigm for the science of physics. It was the, that's just how you understood physics was what Newton did in his Principles of Natural Philosophy from 1687 there. Newton's physics is not our contemporary physics. It's worth bearing, uh, thinking a little bit about what kind of real is revealed by Newtonian physics. Um, his physics is known as a mechanical physics. It introduced both the concepts of gravity and force as ways of um, accounting for the motions of the planet and the motions of things as they fall to Earth. Um, it was an impossibly wonderful construction that served many purposes. But what this physics describes is how massive bodies, idealized as points, move under idealized circumstances in the absence of things like friction and turbulence. So the, it reveals a kind of a clockwork picture of the universe, which is not a full description of that which is real at all. It's not much use at all for discussing minds or even for discussing discusses It treats of movement among inanimate bodies, describing how motion of one is passed to motion of another. It has no way to describe motion that is of another origin such as, for example, when I move. If any living being moves, it's moving under the influence of very, very, very many forces that are not captured within Newtonian physics. If, for example, any movement were ever voluntary, that would find no representation in this. Newton is part of a huge intellectual revolution that happened around the 16th and 17th centuries, in which an older cosmology, that had the Earth at its centre, was replaced by a different view of space and time and hence of the position of the Earth and of ourselves within it. One reason Newton's vision was so compelling was that the account of gravitation he gave worked to describe the motions of the moons of Jupiter and the rotation of the Earth around the Sun, but it also worked to describe apples falling to the ground and billiard balls on the table. That is a, a, a very limited way of describing the real, but that link between the heavens and the earth was part and parcel of this massive change in the way people thought about the nature of space and time. I again need to stress that this is not our contemporary physics and the way space and time are represented in contemporary physics is very different but it provides a framework that was very, very good in providing us with means for doing things like building rockets, um, providing a 
the movement of solid bodies in space and allowed technological developments and seem to have great explanatory remit. Many people still think of a mechanistic explanation as being the epitome, the best form of scientific explanation. And this is something of a mistake. Science does not in any sense demand mechanical explanations. And if you come across science asking the mechanism by which such and such happens is unknown, one of the first questions to ask yourself is, should a mechanical explanation be available? So Johnny goes to church on Sunday. The, mechanics, the mechanism by which this occurs is unknown. I don't think a mechanical explanation is appropriate there. I choose that example because um, it's obvious that a mechanical explanation won't do there. And science has very many tools, very many forms of explanation at its disposal, and it doesn't demand mechanical explanation. So physics has moved on, and modern physics has recharacterized space and time, but it's useful to take note of this one difference between Newtonian physics and modern physics. Newtonian physics was developed in order to make intelligible a world perceived by an embodied being in which objects were of the size of things you could throw or things you could look at. Modern physics makes its observations at scales that are entirely remote from the living. So measuring the diameter of the universe, measuring speed of light, distance in parsecs, or the very, very tiny, trying to understand things that are many millionths of a millimeter uh, across, so the subatomic realm. So both in spatial terms, modern physics deals with the very large and the very small, in temporal terms, modern physics deals with the very large in its cosmology from the Big Bang to the Big Crunch, to the very small, dealing with events that happen and go away again in, in tiny fractions of a second. So the scale of observation of modern physics has transcended the body. It's gone beyond the body. Newtonian physics still provides us with intuitions about the body, but it has nothing to say about mind. So as you can see, it's not straightforward to say what we mean when we say physical. On the one hand, we mean something very real, and on the other, we mean something that is backed by the authority of science, as exemplified in the science of physics. Those are rather different senses. But science is not a unified activity. Science doesn't just have one kind of story to tell. It's no small matter to make the science of the geographer intelligible to the science of the social science scientist or the science of the linguist or the science of the physicist. Science is very many things, very many methods, very many ways of approaching questions, infused perhaps by a, by a similarity of spirit, but it doesn't have a single story to tell and so there won't be a single scientific story to tell about the, any distinction between the physical and the mental. And one thing that we're going to encounter as we go along in this course is that cognitive science tackles this head on. Cognitive science is an interdisciplinary undertaking in which we seek to integrate findings from very many fields and that means learning that people in one field use words differently from people in another field. And we furthermore have to take account of the fact that our words are, as I said, culturally infused. So cognitive scientists need to be careful in their language and they need to develop a, a sensitivity for how the meaning of concepts change as you move from field to field and from one debate to the next. So this is the most important point to be made here. Cognitive science is necessarily interdisciplinary. This is the logo of the Cognitive Science Society, founded in the 1970s. And around the outside, you can see the names of what at that stage were thought of as the central fields of cognitive science. There's artificial intelligence, we'll have something to say about that later. Education is in there. Linguistics, neuroscience, philosophy, psychology, and anthropology. So they're not all sciences. Education and anthropology are not sciences in any strict sense. The others, philosophy is not a science in any strict sense. 
we'll be asking what kind of science is linguistics? What kind of science is psychology? How do the insights of neuroscience translate to other areas? So there's lots to inquire about, but this is letting you know at the start that as we pursue questions in cognitive science, we will be using insights from many disciplines and they don't unify. So you will be left with a challenge to make sense and to be cautious in your sense-making of the findings in the field.